Good morning, Maranatha family. It is great to have you with us this morning. I'm Pastor David, the community life pastor here at Maranatha, and we are thankful that you're joining us for worship this morning here in our worship center or on our live stream. Uh, It's a blessing that you are here worshiping with us. Also, we want to uh, just take a moment and uh, thank any of you that are guests, relatively new, uh, worshiping with us, and we'd love to have an opportunity to connect with you, to follow up with you, find out if there are any questions that we could answer or any things that we could be praying on your behalf. That can happen a couple ways. You could stop by the Welcome Center and fill out a Connect card and turn that in, or you can text the word guest to the number on the screen. That starts an automated process that will gather your contact information and give us the ability to have one of our members reach out to you and find out how we can be praying with you or if we can do anything else. So we'd love to have that opportunity. We're glad you're here. A few announcements as we get started. One, if you are a guest, relatively new, you picked a good day to come. Uh, We're having pizza with the pastors after this service. So if you don't have lunch plans, let me invite you uh, to come and join us. We have pizza. We talk about the vision and and kind of an overview of the ministry of the church, answer some questions. Uh, We'd invite you to come uh, be a part of that with us if you want to do that. As you go out these doors, you're going to turn left. Keep going straight all the way into the nursery lobby, and it'll be in the multi-purpose room on your left, or just find me or someone else and say, where's pizza with the pastors? But we invite you to come and, and take part in that lunch with us today. In addition to that, this coming Friday is Good Friday, and we hope that you'll join us for our Good Friday service. It will be Friday evening at 7 p.m. here, and it will be an opportunity to hear a number of different men share with you snapshots of Christ's glory. I think you'll be challenged and encouraged and blessed, so if you are free, please join us Friday evening at 7. And then this coming Sunday, of course, is Resurrection Day, also sometimes called Easter. I like Resurrection Day better, but we want to encourage you to come and join us next Sunday as well. We'll have our normal services at 9 and at 11, and then we're going to continue our our relatively new tradition of having a designer donut buffet from 10 to 11. Now, that would require you to bring some donuts, so hopefully you'll bring some donuts. In addition, we are adding a health-conscious option, the yogurt buffet. So, You can bring yogurt, yogurt toppings. You can have some yogurt with a half a donut or however you want to work that out, okay? so But that will be next Sunday from 10 to 11. We hope you will plan to join us for that time of fellowship as well as bring some things. You can find out all the details in the Maranatha Minute. So with all of those things said, would you join me as we open in prayer? Heavenly Father, we gather this morning. And Father, we come to you needy. We come to you as people who are born rebelling against you, haters of God. Father, content to rule our own lives and to ruin our own lives. But Father, we come this morning because you have pursued us. Because you and your infinite grace and your mercy have poured out your love upon us through Jesus that he would be willing to come and live the life of intimate obedience to the Father that we could never live. That he would then take our sins on himself, dying on the cross, taking the wrath of God that we deserve, and then giving us an opportunity to receive his righteousness, to be made your children, to be united with him. Father, what a glorious truth it is that we can gather in hope today because of Jesus. So Father, as we come to worship now, Lord, we confess there's so many things that easily distract us, that clutter our hearts and minds, and we ask by your Spirit that you'd help us set those things aside, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth, that our love for Christ would continue to consume us, that we would overflow in praise. Father, as we come under the preaching of your word, we ask that by your spirit you would empower Pastor Andrew as he proclaims the truth to us. But even more so, we ask that your spirit would give us 
hungry hearts, that our ears would be opened to receive the truth. Lord, bring conviction in our lives of sin that still seeks to separate us from you. Encourage us in our faith. Strengthen our hope. Deepen our love for you. Father, that the power of your word would continue to conform us to the image of your Son. And Father, we pray just for the blessing of being together today, that we would take time to connect with those around us, building new relationships or strengthening existing relationships, showing each other the love of Christ that you have shown us, and then taking that same love and the truth you've entrusted to us today into our communities, our homes, our workplaces, our schools, that we would be a light in the darkness, showing those around us in all that we say and do, the glories of Christ and the love that we found in you, until all of them too have experienced who you are and have come to worship you as you deserve. Father, we pray that you would do these things, that you would be glorified, and that even in our worship now, you would be pleased. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. Good morning. Would you stand together? Let's begin our time together by reading this portion of Psalm. Let's read together. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Sing together. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn. straight to face the day in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away Welcome you here, Lord. 
Amen. The author of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 1, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to us through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, worthy of all our worship, honor, glory, and praise. On the altar of our praise this morning, let there be no higher name than Jesus, Son of God. Would you sing this together? You came down from heaven's throne, this earth you formed was not your home, a love like this the world has never known. A crown On the altar of our praise, let there be no higher name, Jesus, Son of God. You laid down your perfect life, you are the sacrifice, Jesus, Son.
the book of Hebrews, the author speaks of uh, Jesus as the great high priest. He speaks of former priests being many in number, but none of them having the ability to once for all pay for our sins. But Christ, when he sacrificed his life on the cross, he paid the price once for all. And he is able to save to the uttermost all who draw near to him in faith. Amen. Would you speak this together? Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. to you this morning, humbled by the gift of your son. Lord, we we can picture it. 
Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, the humblest of ways, our Lord and Lord, Lord of Lords and King of Kings, people laying out their coats on the ground, waving palm branches, laying them on the ground. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Lord, you tell us, you told your disciples shortly after that, that there would be a future day. And they would not see you again until that day when you came back and, and heard, blessed be the name, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, we look forward to that day when you return for your bride. But in the meantime, we are thankful, God, to be able to meet together as the body, to have even the smallest picture of what we will be able to enjoy for all of eternity, not because of anything that we have done, but because of your great love toward us in Christ in sending him to die, to pay the penalty for our sins so that through faith in Christ, our sins could be forgiven and we could enjoy a restored relationship with the Father and all of those in your bride that you have saved. Lord, what an amazing thing to lift up songs to your name as people of God this morning and to declare your praises and to exalt you as our Lord. We are ready to sit under the teaching of your word. And we're thankful, Lord, that you will empower Pastor Andrew, humble him, help him to speak your words, allow, humble us, God, help us to be ready to receive your words. Thank you for the treasure of holding your revelation in our hands and for the power of the Spirit who dwells in us to help us to understand, to receive, to believe, and then to live out the word of God for all of those that you have put us in contact with. Lord, I pray that you would be honored and glorified by our time this morning. Do a work in us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, happy Palm Sunday to you. It's good to have you here. I would encourage you to open up your Bibles, if you would please, to Matthew chapter 21. If you're using the Pew Bible, it's on page 800. And 26. Matthew 21, page 826. This is often referred to as the triumphal entry. And uh, any of you who have grown up in the church or even have been a, been a Christian for several years, this will be a familiar story. We're covering familiar ground. It's uh, some, a story we talk about every year, kind of in preparation for Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. I was listening to a message last night, and uh, um, the pastor who was addressing this passage referred to it not as the triumphal entry, but as the tragic entry. Of course, because what started as an uh, assembly of exaltation, of people welcoming Jesus into the city, affirming his identity as king, then turned quickly just a few days into putting him on the cross. The king of the Jews then crucified on the cross. A tragic entry may be a fitting description. And it's probably easy for us as we look back on that time 2,000 years ago to say, how could those Jews have missed it? How could they have been caught up in the, the flow of exaltation and celebration? How could they, in that moment, things have been so clear in terms of Jesus being king, walking into Jerusalem, fulfilling the prophecies from Zechariah chapter 9. All of these things that were unfolding in front of their very, their very eyes and part of that celebration, and then just a few days to have missed it, to have called for his crucifixion to have put him on the cross, to have handed him over to the Gentiles, to be crucified. It's perhaps no less tragic for the, than for those of us who call ourselves Christians, who would affirm the truthfulness of the authority of Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords, to so often diminish his authority in our lives to relegate that to second place and to allow the challenges of our life and the distractions of our life to take center stage and to keep us from really placing Jesus Christ as king of our hearts. 
And I speak for myself. I find myself so often caught up in the discouragement, in the frustration of things not going my way, of people making decisions that I know are detrimental for them, and there's nothing I can do to change their mind. There's nothing I can do to change the circumstances. And I find myself frustrated. I find myself at times really discouraged. I find myself critical of others. And and, and it demonstrates the fact that Jesus Christ is not king of my life in those areas. That I'm trusting in my ability to push things through. I'm trusting in the fact that, that I'm able to, to order the circumstances of life. And, and when they get out of order, there, there's chaos going on, how discouraged and frustrated I become. It's an indication that I'm doing exactly what this audience in the first century did. To, to, to make a clear confession of Christ as king but to not really live life in a way that that demonstrates a confidence that he is in control, that demonstrates a complete resting in the fact that he is sovereign over all things and that he, by his perfect design, is working them through for his glory and for my good. How easy it is for us to forget not just the reality that Christ is king, but to not place him as Lord of our heart and rest in the kingship of Jesus Christ as the one who is over all. This morning is a reminder to us, a reminder to us of not just the truth and significance of what Jesus does on this day, just a few days before his death, but to help us come to grips with the fact of what does this reality of the kingship of Christ The lordship of Christ, what does it do for us who call ourselves Christians, who call ourselves disciples? How does it change the way we live? How does it change the way we respond to the situations that are happening around us? Jesus Christ is king. We're living in a a culture that pushes against authority. I, I wonder if perhaps... One of the reasons why we struggle with the authority and the kingship of Christ is because of the culture in which we live. We see the powers that exist as powers that we need to push back on. In a recent article, this captures kind of the spirit of the age, as it were. It was written five years ago. It says, quote, The resistance has been an important development It has engaged the public in politics, in protests, raised awareness about the damaging effects of the powers that be, and has become a go-to phrase to capture a moment, but has also prompted criticism of whether it's enough to simply oppose the systems of power, or if there's a responsibility to address the systematic forces that are being exploited, begging questions of whether or not Something beyond resistance is necessary or even possible. There have been moments that go beyond resistance in recent history. A context of resistance only gives that re- rebellion, the rebellious spirit, uh, room to grow and has given some people the impetus to question the nature of our society and wonder whether revolution. Um, a true change to the systems of oppression, discrimination, and disenfranchisement is possible, realistic, or too dangerous. It goes on, resistance is a building actual movements. Resistance is enabling and encouraging amnesty, supporting movements. Understand that resistance creates the basis for rebellion, and that those rebellions are crucial. They are important. They are essential to this change, end quote. That's the spirit of our age. The spirit of defiance, the spirit of rebellion, the spirit of resistance. And we we find ourselves, I believe, caught up in the flow of that way too often. Rather than submitting and yielding and resting in the sovereignty and authority and mastery of God. When we talk about kingship, of course, we talk about Christ's authority, his right to rule, his right to command, his right to make demands on our lives. 
we have a very difficult time comprehending as we will find in this passage what that truly means because of the culture in which we live. But Jesus, while he's coming into Jerusalem in this moment in humility, he's coming in service, he's coming to to welcome sinners into salvation, there will be a day when he will come with power. There, There will be a day when he's coming on a white horse. He's coming with a sword in his hand. He's coming to dominate. He's coming to command. He's coming with authority. This day that we speak about in Matthew chapter 21 is just a foreshadowing of the promise of a future day when Jesus will stake his claim. Revelation 19, 11 says this. Here's a promise we find. Then I saw in heaven hope opened and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the names uh, by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule there with a rod of, rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That is our Savior, Jesus, who is riding on a, on a uh, beast of burden. He's riding in humility on a donkey in Jerusalem. He's one who is... Fulfilling the promises. Fulfilling the promise of Zechariah that was written 500 years before as a foreshadowing of his commitment to fulfill this promise as well. But in that moment, in that day, there will be no more opportunity to turn to him. The king has come. We see in our passage today that he is coming in a way that that is declarative, that is clear. It is demonstrative. We see Jesus, as he comes into Jerusalem, coming to declare himself as king. Turn our our attention to Matthew chapter 21. Let me read for us our passage, and then we'll jump into our study this morning. Matthew 21, beginning at verse 1, it says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt to the full of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowds said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Jesus will make some declarative statements about himself as king. We we begin in verse 1 by seeing the king comes to Jerusalem. He comes to Jerusalem. This was an emphatic statement that Jesus is making about his identity as king. We find that he draws near to Jerusalem in verse 1. This is, of course, David's city. This is the city of Zion. This is the city of God. This is the national and political and spiritual center of Israel. That Jesus comes to Jerusalem is significant because this is the seat of authority. This is the center for worship. This this is the place in which the presence of God was manifest in the temple. He overshadows the temple. The law was kept here. 
The sacrifices were made here. The priests allowed the people to, to have atonement for their sin through the sacrifices at the temple. Jesus is entering this final week of ministry. He makes his final approach to Jerusalem. He has been here dozens of times, of course. He was here early on, just after his birth, to be dedicated in the temple by Simeon. And then uh, a little later, to, to go with his family and to engage the, the priests in asking about who this Messiah would be. Of course, he was here throughout his ministry, healing many, healing the sick and teaching in the temple. But this time was different. This time was marked by the, as the final leg of his journey, which would have started about eight to ten months before this point in his ministry. We find from Luke chapter 9, verse 51, that he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He leaves the ministry of Galilee and begins to, to make his way to Jerusalem. And in the last eight to ten months of his life, he is serving in and around Jerusalem in the region of Judea and just east of the Jordan in Perea. We find that he's given several announcements regarding what will happen, what awaits him there in Jerusalem. His first announcement comes in Luke chapter 9, verse 22. It's followed just a few verses later in Luke 9, 44, this second announcement he gives about his death and resurrection that will take place there. Luke describes Jesus' final journey from Galilee down the eastern side of the Jordan. Jesus knew that this was his last journey. He knew that this was going to be the end, that his final ministry was about to take place. He would take a route that would take place on the eastern side of the Jordan down what is known as the King's Highway. He would make his way in through Jericho and begin his trek, which was about a 20-mile journey from Jericho, about 3,000 feet up to Jerusalem. He knows what's going to await him there in Jerusalem. He says in Luke chapter 18, verse 31 to 34, in taking the 12, he says to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. Here they are, just a couple of miles away from the city. They have spent the night in Bethany, which is about two miles away. They've spent some time in the evening after this trek from Jericho up towards Jerusalem with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Now large crowds begin to gather as they hear that Jesus is in this vicinity of Bethany near Jerusalem. No doubt pilgrims have given word to those who are in Jerusalem itself. And now they're streaming out to find him. There has been a command as well by the Pharisees. Look out for this Jesus. We know he's going to be attending this feast of Passover. This journey significant for so many reasons. Of course, significant because of what Jesus will do in fulfilling prophecy related to salvation his death and resurrection, but also significant in fulfilling one other prophecy, a prophecy that inaugurates his kingship, prophecy made to David. In 1 Chronicles chapter 17, the Lord shows up to David and makes a promise about this future heir, this son of David who will be a king, who will uh, reign on his throne. We find from verse 11, when your days are fulfilled, to walk with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. This promise, of course, reaffirmed by the angel Gabriel, who shows up to Mary on, on, that, on that day to, to talk about the son that will be implanted in her womb. Luke chapter 1, verse 32, he will be great will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. This promise that God had given to David many, many years ago, now fulfilled in his son, 
future son, the son of David, Jesus Christ. And while Israel had had a history of rejecting God and his commands, God had remained faithful, and here they would be again in this final week of ministry, rejecting their Messiah, sending him to the cross, but the promise of God would stand. This unconditional, unrelenting promise of God to fulfill his promise to David to bring a son, to raise up a king. Jesus rides into Jerusalem in fulfillment of that prophecy. We find in verses 2 to 7, not only that as king, Jesus comes into Jerusalem, but we find as king, he has authority over people and events. Every king has a right to make demands. Every king has a right to send out his instructions and to expect them to be fulfilled. And that's what happens here. Jesus, who has authority over people and over circumstances, notice verse 2. He says to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. Jesus sends two of his disciples on ahead. He gives them specific, clear instructions. Jesus has authority to command his followers In the mark of every king is sending a command. And every disciple or follower or subject of that king will follow and obey. We will see that they obey obey immediately. Without hesitation, without question, without altering the command. Bethany, which is about two miles away from Jerusalem, with Bethpage about a mile, at the mile marker, Christ sends them ahead, but gives them specific instructions. Go into the village, he says. Immediately, you will find a donkey and a colt with her. How did Jesus know the specifics of what they would find? Well, because Jesus is the king. And not like any king. Jesus is the king of all. Jesus is the king who comes from God. Jesus has perfect vision, perfect foresight. Jesus knew exactly what they would find in Bethphage because he's a king. That comes from God. Immediately is described here. It's also repeated in Mark. He knew that as soon as they came into the city. They would find these details unfold in front of them. He knew where the donkey would be. He knew that the donkey would be tied. He knew that the donkey would be with her little colt. He knew that the owners would be asking questions about. What are you doing untying these two animals and taking them with you? He had prepared them ahead of time. Even in this, the deity of Christ is on display. His command over circumstances is unmistakable. His foresight in knowing what they would find there in Bethphage, in providing instructions on how to deal with those issues. He says, if anyone says to you, the Lord, uh, what are you doing? The Lord has need of him, and they will send them at once. And that's exactly what happens. Jesus sends his authority to his subjects, The Lord has need of them. The Lord who is master. The Lord who is in control. The Lord who owns these two donkeys in front of you. He can call them into service. And when he does, he gets what he asks for. All of this, of course, was in fulfillment of the direct word of prophecy given by Zechariah. And Matthew is clear to point that out. We find that in verse 5. This took place to fulfill that what was spoken by the prophet Zechariah saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast, a burden. Christ demonstrates his mastery over prophetic fulfillment. His ability not only to know what was spoken about him, in, by the prophets 500 years before, but mastery over the circumstances to work them through. This is drawn from Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, which provide even greater context for the ministry that Jesus would have, not only in providing salvation for the Jews, but notice what we find in verse 10. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. 
humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak, what church? Peace. To who? The nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is what they were anticipating. This is what the Messiah would do. He would bring peace to Israel, yes, but also bring peace to the ends of the earth. You and I, as Gentiles, are included in this promise. And as Jesus rides humble and riding on a donkey, he is ushering in this fulfillment and putting it to work so that we can be beneficiaries of that incredible promise. Christ's mastery over the prophetic fulfillment. Notice that Matthew does not repeat righteous in writing, or excuse me, righteous in having salvation. It's not because Jesus was not righteous. Of course he was. He was perfect. And of course Jesus would provide salvation, but not the salvation that Israel was looking for. They were looking for justice and deliverance, freedom from oppression, the ability to, to, to rise above this Roman rule and to establish themselves as a national identity. Jesus had a different kind of salvation in mind. Jesus had a different kind of righteousness in mind. And of course, he would provide those things, but they would unfold as this week would continue. At this point, Jesus would come in humility. He would come on a beast of burden. He, he would come on a, on a beast that was known as being slow but strong, not particularly agile. And any of you who've ever ridden a donkey will know how stubborn and somewhat defiant they can be. But a beast of burden that's dependable, resilient, and strong. A beast of burden that would illustrate and picture the burden that Christ would carry. Jesus would carry the burden of sin on his shoulders. This beast of burden would, 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 would picture this and, and illustrate this as Jesus is, is riding into the city. We turn our attention to verse 6 and we see the disciples went and did exactly as Jesus had directed them. That's the benefit that we have as disciples. When Jesus gives specific instructions and we carry them out, we position ourselves for the kind of success that they enjoy, the kind of benefits that they see. They carry out Jesus' specific instructions. They don't de uh, deter or alter any of his commands. And that's how they're able to enjoy the benefits of obedience. They follow Christ's instructions to the T. He sets them up for success. They are able to enjoy this accomplishment because Jesus has told them what to expect. Even in the details of answering, the Lord has need of them. We find in Luke chapter 19 that they are questioned and they have an answer all ready to go. The disciples act as servants of Christ. They have bowed their hearts to his kingship, his authority, his leadership over them. And so what do they experience? In verse 7, they brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and, and he sat on them. The instructions were given. They obeyed and followed. And they got to enjoy the benefits of obedience. In verses 8 and 9, we see as king, Jesus receives the welcome he deserves. As king, Jesus receives the welcome that he deserves. Notice, most of the crowds spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees... And spread them on the road. And, and the crowd, crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. There are three different qualities of this entrance that I want to just uh, focus on momentarily. First, I want you to see it was a public entrance. He's welcomed into the city. This, uh, this public display, this public welcome. Matthew uses the word crowds in verse 8, in crowds in verse 9. We, we find the word whole city in verse 10. We find in verse 11 a crowds that are appearing again. In Luke's account, he uses the word multitudes to describe the, the numbers of people that are part of this event. 
The word large crowds, as it's used throughout the Gospels, is used to describe the the gathering of the 5,000 that came to Jesus on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, where there were at least 5,000 men and certainly women and children who were part of that. Maybe as as many as 15 to 20,000 people who were part of that uh, event. The word multitude that is used in Luke is also used of the shepherds who, uh, excuse me, used of the multitude of angels who came to the shepherds, praising God and saying, glory to God on the highest. This multitude of angels. It's the same word that that Luke uses to describe the the multitude of fish that were bursting the the nets of the disciples uh, when they pulled in their, their nets. It's estimated that the city of Jerusalem, its population around 250,000, would swell to over 2.5 million during this Passover event as people were streaming in from all around Israel. It's not an exaggeration, then, to suggest that many thousands of individuals were part of this procession. Maybe tens of thousands of individuals. Those who met Jesus in Bethany and those who streamed out of the city of Jerusalem to welcome him this public display. In all of these things, Jesus is willingly accepting the praise that they are providing. In all other instances throughout Jesus' ministry, he wants to put to silence his identity. He wants to silence those who would speak about who he is and, and reveal his true nature. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 30 and 31, When Jesus heals the blind men, he says, their eyes were open and Jesus sternly warned them, see that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame throughout all that district. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 16 and 20, Simon Peter makes a confession. Simon Peter replies, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. In Mark chapter 7, verses 31 to 36, Jesus is healing a man who is, who is deaf and mute. It says his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And over and over and over again, Jesus is commanding those who's, who he's healed and his disciples, be quiet about it. But here in this moment, Jesus allows this publicity. He allows this praise to continue because he knows the end is near. He knows that in just a few short days, his hour has come. And now his true identity can come out into the, into the open. And by affirming and receiving this credit, this praise, Jesus is proclaiming that I am in fact the son of David. I, I am in fact the king that is coming. I am in fact the Messiah. Now, his presence is in full view. He knows that his hour has come. It was also in reverence. It was not only public, but notice it was reverent. But the crowds are crying, Hosanna to the son of David, in verse 9. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This word, Hosanna, which is the word God saves. They were looking for salvation. Of course, initially it was for deliverance over oppression. They were speaking this from Psalm 118 that we read together a little earlier. A psalm of deliverance. uh, This conqueror's psalm as as it came to be understood. And Jesus is receiving these praises of a conqueror receiving these praises of of one who is coming in the name of the Lord to establish his kingdom. The significance of the branches in in the cloaks that were spread on the way describe the devotion of those who are following after Jesus. The branches that were used in celebration of victory of kings that we find from the Old Testament. The cloaks that were, that were a, a, a representation of, of laying one's own possessions down symbolically expressing that whatever you ask, we will be willing to give up. This was a loud, attention-getting kind of celebration, but also extremely risky in the shadow of Jerusalem. It could have been easily misunderstood 
celebrating he who comes in the name of the Lord, the son of David, who will establish his kingdom, coming in towards Jerusalem. This Roman guard would have been certainly increased during this event of Passover with these millions of gatherers that were in Jerusalem. And of course, as we know, looking back into Luke, we, we know how, how paranoid Pilate was, how impulsive he was, how violent he was in putting to silence those who opposed him. Luke chapter three, 13, verse 1. Jesus describes an event. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifice. And he answered them, Do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Here they are in the shadow of the walls of Jerusalem. Here they are, this risky place where Pilate could put all of these things to silence. But Jesus allows this celebration to take place because, in fact, he was king. We also notice it was orchestrated. It was orchestrated. The crowds that are crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. A, a title that was used only a few times in Jesus' ministry. Once at the beginning of his ministry from two other blind men, once by a Canaanite in Tyre and Sidon, and once by two blind men that Jesus happened to see there in Jericho just before this final ascent into Jerusalem. Hosanna to the son of David. We find from, from Matthew chapter 20, which is the chapter right before this triumphal entry. Jesus' ministry, the disciples, these pilgrims, are making their way from the eastern side of the Jordan River, making their way up to Jerusalem. And we find they went out of Jericho. A great crowd followed them. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. A title that we will see again in our passage today, son of David. A title that will spill into Jerusalem as the children are crying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This title of these two blind men who we find from Matthew chapter 20, verse 34, who join their party. Jesus, it says, in pity, touched their eyes, and immediately they received their sight and followed him. I believe it would be these two men, perhaps, and, and those who experienced the miracle of the, of the sight being restored that, that are in the, the, the front of this parade, crying out, Son of David, that Jesus has orchestrated this event to coincide with his final coming into Jerusalem. How many times through his ministry had he been through, Jer through Jericho? How many times in his ministry had he perhaps passed these two blind men, but by the providence of God, his sovereignty allowed it to line up so these men were healed just before entering the city of Jerusalem this last time, I believe, probably leading the charge of crying out, Jesus, son of David. As we come and make our way to verses 10 and 11, we see as king, Jesus came to bring salvation. As king, Jesus came to bring salvation. Notice, and when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. This word to stir is the word to to cause anxiety, to shake, or to tremble. It's, it, it's the same word that, that's used in Matthew chapter 27 to speak of the, of the earthquake that takes place, this, this shaking of the ground that is happening. The, the whole city is in, up, in, in an uproar. The whole city is troubled by this coming of Christ. But rather than leading him to the seat of, of, uh, of authority, rather than crowning him king in that moment, it seems to dissolve almost as quickly as it begins. And of course, we know the reason. The reason for this ending so quickly is because Jesus had other plans. 
Again, he's mastering, he's the master of all of these events because he understands, as we saw in Luke chapter 18, 31 to 33, that Jesus came to die. Taking the 12, he says to them, see, we're going up to Jerusalem. Everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished, for he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. Jesus came as king and fulfillment of prophecy. But first, he came to save. He came to seek and to save the lost. He didn't come to be king in that moment over a physical world. He came to be king over hearts, king over lives, king not only over Israel and the Jews, but king over all, king of Jews and Gentiles. As we, as we reflect on this passage, we need to ask ourselves some questions. In response to Jesus as king, does Jesus have the right to command us? Does Jesus have the authority to tell us what to do? Does, does Jesus have the right to expect that the instruction that he gives in his word is a, an instruction that we will follow? Will we be accountable? Do we think that we are accountable to the word that Christ has spoken in the scriptures? Do we believe that the things that he's called us to do is the mission that we should be about carrying out from day to day? Does Jesus have the right to command? Next, does Jesus have the right over our stuff? Does he have a right over our property? Does he have a right over our good things? Does he have a right over our families? Does he have a right over our future? Does he have a right to call us into his mission? Does he have a right over our future, over our occupation, over our studies? Does he have a right over our relationships? Does Jesus have a right to call us into service? Next, does Jesus receive the welcome that he deserves from us? Does Jesus receive the welcome that he deserves from us? Is, is, is the welcome that we give to him a public welcome? Or is, or is it a welcome that is covert? A welcome that is hidden? A, a welcome that is secret? Are we those who confess Christ before men? Are, are we those who, who, who worship him and are, are unashamed of the gospel of Christ? Is, 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 is the welcome that we give to him a reverent welcome, a worshipful welcome, a consistent welcome? Is it a planned welcome? Are we those who consistently make Christ king of our lives? We, we enter into those times of understanding who he is and, and welcoming his instruction into our lives and telling us who he is and what he desires. And finally, do we look to Jesus saying, Hosanna? Do we look to Jesus as one who saves, as one who delivers, as one who helps and rescues? Do we look to Jesus as the one who is the, the plan A, as it were, in terms of fixing our problems? Are we willing to, to submit our issues, our trials, our frustrations to him and, and, and live in a way that is in confident expectation, the hope that Christ is in charge. It's so easy, isn't it? It's so easy when things seem to be spinning out of control to allow our hearts to be taken along with that, to be frustrated, to be discouraged, to be in despair, to want to take control, to, to want to be those who are are pressing in and trying to, to, to work things out on our own, not understanding, as Peter will say in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, he says, in this you rejoice. Though in a while you, you, you are experiencing trials, but God is working these trials for your benefit. That the testing of your faith, it produces patience. It's, it's working something out in us. Are, are, we allow, are, are we willing to allow the hard things of life, those custom-made trials, as it were, to produce in us a greater faith, a greater worship, a greater loyalty to Christ? Willing to, are we willing to trust him with hard things? Those who 
have made Christ king will be those who champion the cause of confidence in him and and enjoy and experience his peace. As Christ says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Might we find rest for our souls in Christ who is king. Oh God, we pray that the reality and the truth of your kingship, your lordship, would help to give our hearts rest, would help us to live in confidence, to help us to be those who are not experiencing anxiety or frustration or discouragement, not that those can't exist for those who are believers, but that we turn them over to you. We give them to you as one who is in control, who is in charge. May you be king of our lives, And may those who see us know that there's a confidence that is outside of this world, a confidence in the king who is over all. And may that welcome them into relationship with you as we have opportunities to point to Christ who is king. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day.